Too cold for bikes. <laughs> All right, so let's get it started. So we finished the second module last time. Um, so as usual, your write-up is due within a week. So we are going to start the module three, which is mostly about application. So I'm going to show you applications of what we learned in the last two last few classes uh, on learning and uh, and you see all of the, the the components that we we introduced in the previous classes in in, uh, in, in, in the following lectures all the way to the end of module three so uh, today I'm going to talk about discrete sequential models and general conditional random fields CRF um, so these uh, figure should be familiar to you when you are talking about learning uh, UGN. So we have a data. Uh, so we are assuming here that the data is given to us, and the structure of the model that we are going to explore are different kinds of graphical model. But we are, we are assuming that the model is, uh, is fixed, and our learning objective is uh, maximum likelihood estimation. During the talk today. Uh, we are going to learn the parameters, but to learn the parameters, we see that the components of the inference are also involved. So today, lectures is mostly about conditional random field, and more specifically, we'll talk about uh, part of speech tagging and uh, some case studies on segmentation. So um, part of speech tagging uh, in natural language processing, uh, there are several models introduced for that, and we're going to discuss some of those hidden Markov model that I'm presuming that all of you guys have seen in your uh, machine learning course, you're going to see a variation uh, of, uh, of that that is a mixture of, uh, it's basically a directed graphical model, it's called, uh, and, uh, it's called maximum entropy Markov model. And we're going to see, uh, we see that the NEM has some issues that uh, get fixed in CRF. And uh, we're going to digress a little bit talking about minimum risk base estimator uh, that changes the cost function a little bit and uh, a little bit of digression on more like a philosophical things on the generative versus discriminative models in general. And we'll end the class with the, segment, the case study on the segmentation. So uh, to, to set up the, the scenario, you're assuming that you're given a set of sentences and somebody has spent time and tag those for us, tag the, the word, the sentence for us. Like what is now, what is where, what is um, uh, the rest of it. So our samples are pairs of x, the sentence, and the tagging. Now, we want to learn, we, we want to train a system that basically does this for us automatically. And the method that we are going to start would be hidden Markov. We're going to start with hidden Markov model and study the different aspects of that. So if you remember the factor graph, I think we discussed this, that uh, is a form of representation of the graphical model and uh, UGM and DGM, that each of these boxes represent the factors and sequence represent random variables. So in this case, if you're thinking about it at the start, so always uh, we are representing our data as a start of a sentence and end of a sentence and in between all the words. So our uh, y0 is always the word start. So, and x are our words and y's are our tags. This is just to set up. All right, so 
we talked about the factors, how the factors look like. Is, in this case, our factors are uh, binary between two random variables. So it's going to be basically uh, a set of tables. So because our y's are tags, so the set of factors is going to be set of tags. So, uh, so let's assume for simplicity, you have only four tags, verb, noun, uh, and uh, the other two. And here, each of these factors is going to be shared across all of these uh, all of these factors. So I'm assuming that, uh, that uh, we are using the same factor between this and this. The parameters are shared because there is no reason to assume that this is, this is changing. We also have a factor between tag and a, and a word that on, on, on the columns you see different kinds of the words in a dictionary and on, on, a, on, a, on, a, on a rows you see different tags. So you can view it as a long vector of tags here, I'm assuming there are only four tags for simplicity, and the, 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 the number of, uh, this is going to be my rows, and my number of columns would be everybody in my dictionary, every word in my dictionary. That's the setup. We don't assume that this is learned, but I'm just giving you an example how it's going to look like. Look, I'm going to learn these tables, these factors. So now, um, as I said, we're going to reuse some of these factors because uh, the, 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 number, uh, the, the factors between these two are shared. So I'm going to reuse the same factor between y1 and y2. Uh, I'm going to use it for y2 and y3. So I'm assuming that that does not change with, as you go through our sentence. Yes? So we have like, let's say, like y1, y2, y2, y3. So yeah. The, so the set of factors actually propagates all the way to the chain. Because of that. Like if there's an overlap between them. What do you mean propagate? Like, the same set of the factors, same set of factors, factors are, are going to be like, yes the same and thing. that is because the kids overlap like y1 and y2 so i'm going to use so this is a function right this is a function and this is always this right i'm assuming that i'm using the same function for all of them because i don't have i just want to reduce the number of parameters there's no reason to assume that the function f1 and f2 are different okay. right okay so um okay so let's say so at the end of the day, my factor graph is going to represent my joint, dense, uh, joint distribution between factors and the words that I've seen. So here's a specific uh, configuration of the tags and, and the words for a, a sentence which has one, two, three, five letters. So time flies an arrow. So now I want to compute the joint density between them. So all I need to do is go and read the, 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 the right uh, uh, entry in each of these tables. So let's, so help me with that. So the first one is noun, verb, P and D. So how can I write it down? So which elements I have to pick? For, so remember, this is a factor graph, right? So it should be multiplication of this, 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 and so on and so forth. Right? They're just going forward. Which elements of these tables I have to read? What, what numbers? For the first one, tell me what, what should be the first one for the noun. Four. Why four? Yeah, exactly. Should be this one, right? Okay. And then for the noun and a verb, I have to go and uh, read this one, noun and a verb, right? And so on and so forth. So this would be, my factor graph would be multiplication of all of these numbers. Well, the problem that we have here is that it's supposed to be probability, and I'm just multiplying a uh, bunch of positive numbers with each other. But remember that the Gibbs distribution has a, has a normalizer. And uh, so I realized that I have to normalize it. But basically, what was the normalizer? It's like normal, normalizer was summing over all possible configuration and just dividing by that sum. Right? Okay. So there would be a normalizer, and then I get my probability. That is uh, basically uh, a quick review of what uh, we talked last time uh, about UGM factor graph and description uh, All right, so, so this will give me the, the joint distribution between y and x's. Um, um, again, a reminder, each of these factors are not necessarily probability distribution, it's just, it tells us how a specific configuration of let's say n and n follows by n are likely. So 
here if we think uh, uh, so are, are, are like you know corresponding to each other so it's not that likely that a verb is followed by another verb so this is why v followed by another v is not that likely but it's really likely to have a noun followed by verb so this is why that these numbers are not normalized yet it's just a normalized value and z basically helps us to normalize it right so it's like how much one state likes the other state but it's it's not uh, necessarily um, uh, it's not necessarily normalized they are not necessarily symmetric as well so because you know the the, the chance of having noun followed by verb is not the same as verb followed by noun so that's obvious but at the end so the, that is basically the setup that we have um if i want to compare this mrf with uh, uh, with uh, with the bayesian network remember that the difference between if i can show both of them with the factor graph but the difference between mrf and bayesian network is that each of the factors were normalized and this is why this is why the learning with bayesian network was way easier because there was no term that combined uh, that, uh, merge them all together and if I represent my graph uh, my, my, if my factor graph is going to rep represent a Bayesian network each of the factors is going to be normalized right so so it's normalized over columns or rows I mean of course you can see it but ho hopefully you know why it's normalized over one not the other right why is it why this is column sum uh, normalized, not row sum normalized. If I sum over rows, over columns, sums to one, but not over uh, rows. Why? It's normalized in rows, not. Right, so it's so like eight, one, 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 right? If I sum over the other side, it's not one. Why? It's a Bayesian network representation, right? So it's representing, if this is y1, this is y2, it's representing y2 condition on y1. So y2 represents columns, y1 represents rows. So if I is for this condition for this conditional probability, if I if I sum over y two is sum to one, there is no reason to sum. Uh, if I so this is equal to one, but if I change that to y one, it's not equal to one, right? Okay. All right. So of course, if I have a Bayesian network, I don't need to worry about normalizing it. So, um, but if I have MRF, I have to worry about this normalization. So, another thing that we're going to discuss today is a conditional random field. So, the difference between modeling conditional distribution and the joint distribution is that if we, so here, our graphical model, if, if I'm directly modeling conditional, I'm modeling this, for, but not this. Right? It's not joint distribution of the tags and the words. I'm only representing the conditional. Right? And the difference between do these two graphs, I can represent both of them with the, with the, with the factor graph. The only difference is that it's, uh, so if you compare this with the previous one, you see that this is gone. Right? Because it is clamped, it is clamped to the observed value. So, for each of these nouns, I'm going to represent those with, with, with whatever observed, whatever things that, that I, whatever words that I've observed. So time is a noun. I'm going to focus on a noun, but not the rest of it. And if I'm, if the, the, if the fly is a verb, I'm going to uh, focus on verb. So the states are clamped. So I'm not, I'm not modeling P, X, and Y. I'm not going to model this. I'm modeling P, Y, given X. So for me, x is fixed. I'm, pro I'm basically defining probability distribution over space of y's given x, given a specific configuration of x. 
And we're going to see that more often. So again, the form of factor graph is the same, but the meaning of the graph is different. Because one of them is modeling conditional, the other one is modeling joint distribution. So um, as I told you, the difference between that, between that, because I'm not directly modeling excess, I'm clamping one of, uh, I'm clamping that the factors correspond to x to one value that I've observed. And it varies from one set, set of words in a sentence to another set of words in a sentence. Is that part clear? That what is the difference between modeling conditional versus modeling the joint distribution? Okay. So, um, so as I said, in this case, because I don't care about modeling x, I, I, all I need to, uh, to think about is modeling y given x, which, by the way, this is what we do all the time when we are doing regression, right? right? When we are doing regression, we are saying that I'm modeling py given x. I'm not modeling x. I just define the probability distribution over y. So in a regression, this is very simple case. So I'm representing that as x beta plus some epsilon. I'm not modeling x explicitly. I just define a noise for y. Here, you can think of it as a fancier version of regression that y is not just a number. It can be a whole sequence. And it can be multivariate distribution. So think of it, think of, think of a function, oops, think of a function that get x and produce y, except that y is not a number, it's a whole series. It's a, it's a whole uh, multivariate distribution over y. So my y is a, is a fancier thing. Is that the setup between modeling conditional and, generate, uh, and the fully generative model clear? Okay. So we have gone uh, through uh, forward and backward model in, in HMM a little bit last time. Uh, although perhaps with not with the same name, but we reviewed me message passing. I want to make this connection that we talked about two general algorithms, sum product and max product. So remember that sum product was to compute some marginals, and max product was to compute maximum or posterior or maximum assignment. And we said that these two are exactly the same, that the machinery is exactly the same, that except the difference between them is that one of them we had sum, the other one is uh, we, we applied the math, but we, we had the same mechanism for message passing and all that. Some product message passing, uh, uh, some product belief propagation in HMM, because it was invented before all of this, is called forward backward algorithm. And if you are interested in maximum assignment probability, the, the algorithm that we, we introduced maybe more than, three, more than uh, a week ago, uh, and some a max product belief propagation is a uh, Viterbi algorithm. The only reason that this guy has a different meaning, different name is that because for specific HMM, uh, both Viterbi and back for, forward backwards, backward introduced before some product, but later on, people generalize it for, to, a, to a general graphical model, and we know that they're equivalent now. So, so to connect, so probably in your machine learning class, you heard those as a forward backward algorithm and Viterbi algorithm, but I want to tell you that all you know about some product and max product this is the same algorithm if you, apply, if you apply it on, on, on HMM. But of course, the, the max product and some product are more general. You can apply much more general cases. So in the a, in a, in following slides, I'm going to fill up this uh, algorithm, uh, this table for you and by comparing different algorithms. So, um, you already know from your previous class and also some uh, uh, from uh, message passing classes on how to compute marginal distribution, maximum assignment, or maximum or posterior distribution from HMM. I'm going to introduce two more models uh, that are MEM and linear chain, and I'm going to compare those with HMM algorithm for parallel switch tagging. So, um, so to go back to uh, um, 
the discussion that we have about conditional random field and the tagging problem that we have, I'm going to run it, it. I'm going to use this simple example. Let's say that somebody is giving you a, a, a sentence which has only three words. Find preferred tags. And you want to tag this. So, um, well, if you just look at the word find, find can be verb, find can be noun. And also, preferred can be adjective, can be the past tense of prefer. And similar for tags, tags can be noun, can be uh, a, a, a verb. So if you just look at the words, you cannot detect the, uh, the tags correctly because there is ambiguity. So you have to put this in a context. So the models that we have, such as conditional random fields and, uh, and uh, HMM and any other models that we, we are going to discuss today helps us to not only look at the, the verb itself but also put, the con put them in, into the context. So what we want to do is to find the joint probability distribution between y1, y2, and y3 at the same time. So if you only look at the verbs without uh, uh, accounting for the context, you are basically only accounting for these factors. So if you train a simple classifier that reads a word and produces a tag for you, it basically corresponds to only these uh, factors. So the extra factors is to account for the context. So to, um, to tell you a little bit of background about uh, how belief propagation comes into this context of uh, using CRF for tagging, remember that um, uh, as I mentioned, the forward-backward algorithm that we had is just message passing algorithm. So we had a belief. So we, we are interested to compute the belief uh, for each word, accounting for all of the words around it. So at the end of the message passing algorithm, uh, when a, sim a, a, a random variable receives all of the forward messages and backward messages, he can multiply all of them together and form a belief that what other words around me thinks of me, right? So at the end of the day, prefer form a belief that uh, I'm more verb or I'm more adjective. And so how we did that? We did it through message passing. We had a message that's coming from all of the verbs, all of the words on the left side of it. And which here I'm representing it as, as alpha. And all of the message, all of the information that we have on the right side of it, that I'm here I'm representing as beta. And of course, we have to incorporate the word itself. So it's coming from preferred. So preferred overall, without, without thinking about the context, most of the time is verb. And sometimes is an adjective. But when you put that in the context, that changed the equation. And, and as you see, in this context, it changes the preference from being uh, most of the time verb to, to be uh, adjective in this case. So, and this is basically what we did through message passing. So, what is the, the forward message passing algorithm? If you remember, we showed this, uh, if you remember the example that I gave you back then, uh, it was a uh, King, we call it annoying fly. So you remember there was a, uh, three doors, and um, in these three doors, uh, there was a, a, the cheese, a smelly cheese, and this fly was like going through all of that. And I told you this message passing can be represented as the state of the, the fly at this point multiplied by the transition algorithm. So it's a matrix vector multiplication. So when your states are discrete, message passing is nothing but a bunch of vector message, vector matrix multiplication. So forward would be, uh, so if I'm assuming that, for example, the, the factors between y1 and y2 is shared, so this is the same factor as these factors. So you can view the message passing from right as right side multiplication, and message passing from left from left side multiplication. So um, again, 
um, every time that the, the, the message, the, the, the content of the message was coming from the left side of it, and every time, so whenever the, the message is received by a node, it's, it's multiplying by all of the messages received from the other node, and pass it to a factor. When a factor receives a message, it applies its belief about the surrounding and pass it through. Anybody remember uh, what was the, so we had two sort of uh, mechanisms in this case that factors were uh, treating the message differently than nodes. Do you remember what was the difference between the way that factors and nodes were treating the messages? So if you remember, so what is the structure of the, uh, the belief network? It's a bipartite graph, right? On one side is a node, on one side, on one side is the factors, on one side is the nodes. And we said that if you remember, we had this graph. So these are my factors, and these are my nodes. So F1 is X1, X2, and we're now doing message passing for all of the incoming. So if a node wants to send the messages that is received from F1 or all of the other factors, it has to multiply them all together and send it. This is all the, the, the node does. And the factors, it multiplies them all together, applies its own belief, which is its own table, sum over all of the other random variables that the other guy does not understand and send it. But overall, the, the forms were very similar. So, um, so this is basically the review of, uh, of um, message passing. So, but in, in this specific example, just to be a little bit more clear, so here I'm representing this simple sentence, which has only three verbs. And each of these words can have three states, just for simplicity. So here I'm using ellipsoid to represent all possible states of this algorithm. Of, 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 of this uh, probability distribution. So I'm presuming that only possibilities that we have in this graph is verb, noun, adjective, just to go out in an easier way. So you can view as a, as a message passing. So remember, this is the, the entire thing is a random variable, but each of these triangles are the state inside of this random variables. So you can view this message passing as a, as a path that goes through the state. So how did it work? So, so let's say that for a specific configuration, find is a verb, prefer is, a, is an adjective, and tag is a noun. We start from uh, we, st um, we start from a start uh, uh, start uh, start uh, state, and pass the message between them. So every time we pass through a factor, that factor applies belief and send the message to the next state. So here I'm just showing, of course, we are not going to do it this way, and uh, enumerating over uh, all of these possible states because it's computationally insane. But I'm just showing you if I would have done it, you can view it, you can view this uh, probability of this configuration as probability of a path. So probability distribution of the find being verb, prefer being adjective, and tag being a noun is probably the distribution of this specific path. So, and how we compute this probability distribution? We compute this probability distribution by multiplying these unnormalized factors with these seven unnormalized factors. Why do I see seven? Because this is, we have seven factors, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right? Every time we pass through a path, that the factor applies belief on it and pass it through, right? And then, of course, we have to normalize it, and let's assume that somebody has given us that to normalize that. But the specific configuration of verb, noun, and an adjective is basically distribution over this uh, path. So, of course, in this setting, um, I'll get back to you. So, in this setting, this path has the highest probability. But if you don't know it the prior, you have to compute all of the path. Of course, if you want to compute this, all of this path in a naive way, 
is going to be exponential, but we introduce this uh, dynamic programming the type of uh, thing which basically called message passing to compute this uh, efficiently. Yes, you have a question? Uh, so um, you said when you calculate using the factors, uh, you need to marginalize. The reason there is no marginalizing here is that. Oh, there's a marginalization. There's a Z here, right? You said every time a factor is included, it needs to yeah. be so, No, no, no. You apply the marginalization at the end. Right? If you have a Bayesian network, there's no marginalization. Z is equal to 1. Right? For a given UGM, you, there is a mar marginalization that you somehow manage to compute, which is basically an inference, unfortunately. But you have it somewhere. But here, I'm giving you intuitively how it works. Every time that you pass through a factor, that factor will influence your path, which here, if you go from start to a verb, the first factor's element 0, 1 applies its, its belief on it. Next time that you pass through verb to adjective, you're going to have the effect of verb adjective. Next time that you go from adjective to noun, next factor is going to influence. And every time also, the, the, the content of each it, it's where applied belief on it. But of course, if you just multiply the factors, you're, gonna get pro, you're not going to get probability. So you have to divide this by 1 over z. This is our Gibbs distribution, right? Remember, the, the Gibbs distribution was 1 over z theta, sum over all of the clicks, click potential, xc. That was our joint distribution. These are the factors. These are the factors. Make sense? Okay. Of course, this is one path, but I mean, there are all other possibilities of the path. For example, what if A is an adjective? It's very unlikely. But what if A is an adjective, and then the next one would be uh, adjective 2? Very, very unlikely. But anyway, so if you don't know a priori the best optimal path between them, you have to go through all of this. But the message passing is basically a way to do this in an efficient way. So to give you an idea of what marginal probability was, so for example, if you want to, to, to say, if you want to compute what is the probability, this marginal probability distribution of y2 equal to a, that equivalence to <coughs> setting y2 equal to a and summing over all of the paths. So what are the other possibilities of reaching a? So maybe the previous one is verb, maybe the previous one is noun, but I have to find all of the path that goes through this. So if you think about path, if you want to have another intuition of what, what marginalization does, is basically mar computing the joint distribution of all of those was, uh, as I told you in the previous slide, was equivalent of computing the best path. Computing the marginal equ is equals to, equals to computing some of all paths that passes through specific states. And similarly, for example, if I want to compute P equal, uh, Y2 equal to now, so I have to go through all of these paths that goes through now. We are not going to do that. We, we didn't do this naively, but I want to give you an intuition. If you think about path, that's what marginal means. And similarly for verbs. So, um, well, of course, as I told you, if you want to do it naively, you have to enumerate over all possible verbs. And this is exponential. This is so expensive. So we have this message passing algorithm that computes all of the message that goes from left and goes from right. So the, for example, if I want to compute the marginal of y2 being now, I have to, I have to receive all of the possible paths that passes through now, which I can show it as alpha 2 now, the weight of all of these uh, path uh, prefixes. And to compute this, I don't need to actually enumerate this path, this path, and this path. The message passing is a dynamic program you need to do that. So all I need to do is sum over all of these paths. And similarly for beta 1. So the, the, the general idea is at the end is, is, is as follows. that. All you care about is some of all of these paths. 
you don't need to have A, B, and C. You all, all you need to do is computing A plus B plus C. And similarly for the message that's coming from the other side. You want to know X, Y, and Z. If, if somehow I have an algorithm that give you the, gives you the sum, you don't care about having X and Y and Z explicitly. So at the end, if you want to compute AX, AY, AZ, and BX, so the least six term, you only need to compute these two together. So the naive way of computing this sum is having access to A, B, C, X, Y, and Z explicitly and doing this multiplication. But if I can write this multiplication as A, B, C multiplied by X, Y, Z, I don't need to give you X, X, Y, and Z explicitly. I have to come up with an algorithm, which is basically dynamic programming or message passing, that gives you this sum and this sum. You just multiply them together. The result would be the same. And this is basically the underlying trick of what we did last time, and we call it message passing. Instead of enumerating all of these possible paths, which is exponential, instead of all you care about is this sum. I'm going to give you the sum. Make sense? <coughs> Is the setup like why why this uh, setup? So I think at the beginning when I, when I was trying to uh, motivate this for you, I told you that well you can put the sum outside and enumerate. So remember that all of this marginalization we had a bunch of sums and something here, right? So if you want to enumerate all of the uh, all of the possibilities, in sum is like is exponential because if this is k, this is k, and this is k, if I have, I don't know, m of these is going to k to the power of m. But the trick was that the form of the function that we have here was such that it was decomposable. And I, I, we were able to do to push each of these sum inside and compute this. This is another way of saying the same thing. OK. So. At the end, computing margin marginals was basically computing all of the messages that I received from my left, from left, from right, and of course the verbs that I uh, observed, in this case prefer, multiplying them all together and normalizing it. So I have all of the messages from left, which is I call them alpha for now, uh, for this specific configuration. And um, if I want to compute the probability of P Y two equal to noun. I have to multiply the belief of all of the nodes on my left side that think that I am noun. They think that I'm noun. Multiply by all of the messages that I receive from my right side that think that I'm noun. And basically consult with the verbs that I am, which is preferred, which here I'm representing as this and multiply it together and normalize it, and that's my marginal. And, and similarly for the other one, if we want to compute the, the probability of PY2 being verb, all of the message, uh, all of the, the belief of the, the other words in a sentence that things I'm a verb, right side that things I'm a verb, and consult my work and compute the belief. So, um, this basically summarizes what we did in the form of hidden Markov model. So in hidden Markov, what is hidden? The tags are hidden. They're not observed. The verbs are observed. And we have a Bayesian network, Bayesian network, that starts from the start tag, tag the sentence, and uh, uh, and the joint distribution can be can be written as emission probability and the transition probability, right? And it's also obvious from our Bayesian network. So, but there are issues with this model. So, first of all, remember that this is so here. I'm what I'm doing here. here I'm I'm modeling both x and y at the same time. But if somebody tells you that, you know, all I care about is tagging. I don't care about generating new sentence. I just, I give you, I give you a sentence and you tag it for me. 
I don't ask you to, to make a new sentence for me, just tag it. So why should I model the join distribution? It seems that if your objective is tagging, you're better off modeling y given x. But you just save some effort. You are not interested to generate new sentences. You only generate, you're only interested to generate new tags. So why not modeling this directly? So it seems that HMM in this case is wasting some effort. So another thing which is um, important is that um, Okay, so, so, so as I told you, the HMM modeling the joint distribution of the tags and a sentence. But if all you care about is tagging, you're only interested in this. So why not having another model that does that? Another thing which is, uh, which is important here is that in HMM, although we are collecting all of the information from all of the the, the sentence on my on the left and on the right, the emission probability only sees the, the, the words on it, right? So if I if I'm y2, I see a summary information from my other verbs through the message that I receive from the left, and all of the messages that I receive from the uh, the right. But I don't see those set, uh, those verbs. I, the only verbs that I see is x2, right? Wouldn't it be that better to Incorporate all of those information. Can I give an, uh, provide an access to those? So maybe maybe I have to introduce another arrow, or maybe so somehow I wanted to have access to those. So that improved the result because sometimes you have to HMM only looks at the local information. Maybe you want to see that I might be I might be uh, a verb if the next word that comes after me has start with capital letter. So maybe I say, maybe I say I like flowers, uh, or I said, um, you know, the the book smells like a flower. So this like and that like, the one of these verbs, the other one isn't. So, or it smells like a I don't know the, the, the name of the brand of the of the of the perfume. So if the name of the brand of the perfume, it usually starts with capital. So I want to see that if I'm under, if I want to tag the word like, I want to see my the, the word next to it. That might have some information for me. So an HMM does not account for that. So what is a, what's another way? So so what if if you do this instead of thinking causally that, it, that there is a tag that introduce that produce a verb, I'm going to reverse the direction and go from the entire sentence to all of these tags. Re remember that, so, in term, if you think causally, this makes more sense than this. Because here, the arrows here are representing, uh, are going the other side. But I want you to pay attention that arrows does not always have a causal meaning. It's just conditional, it's just uh, uh, conditional property distribution. So how am I going to model it? So this is one way of modeling. For each tag, so if I have a word uh, of the sentence, find the uh, find preferred tag, this is my entire x. So here I'm representing this as x over y. Uh, I'm going to provide the entire sentence to each of the tags. So how, so what is the, how can I come up with the distribution? So I'm, uh, I'm going to reverse the arrow and view this as a, as a, as a uh, regression. So the way it works is that I'm going to extract some features from pair of the tags next to each other and also incorporate sentence and somehow come up with some features that we'll discuss some of those later and normalize it. Right, so the result would be still is a is, is a Bayesian graph called mul is is a is a Bayesian network, but is multiplication of bunch of factors. So you can view it as sort of regression between pairs of random variables between these pairs and whatever they observe 
between these pairs and whatever they observe. So each of those is a regression. And also notice that because each of those are regression, there is no overall normalizer because I'm normalizing each of these pairs independently. Right? So if, if you compare it with Bayesian, if, with HMM, HMM, the Z was equal to 1 because each of these was actual probability. Here, what I'm showing here is that I'm viewing each of the pairs of Y1, Y2 as a regression and normalized locally. Right? It's easier to normalize because let's say that if you want to tag them, if you have, let's say, five states, I have to enumerate over five by five. Right? Z is easy to compute. So, so basically, this is the idea of so-called uh, maximum entropy mar uh, Markov models, or MEMM. So instead of providing each of the, the local information to each of the tags, it's going to provide the entire sentence to each of the tags. And, and it's going to normalize each pairs of the tags and have the following form. I have to mention that this arrow right now does not have any causal meaning because you are reversing the di direction and if you think causally that doesn't make sense. Nevertheless, as I said, arrows does not necessarily have a causal meaning. It's just conditional independence. So this is an example of a distributive model because here I'm not modeling P, Y, X. I'm just modeling Y. So there is no way I cannot use this model to generate new sentences. But I only care about tagging. So why not going for this community model? So this model, the learning objective is to learn PY given X, learn the parameters of PY given X. But this model also has some shortcomings. So let me give you an example. So let's say that I have a sentence that has five words in it. And each of these tags can take five states. So first word, second word, uh, third, and fourth. And each of those have five states, like I don't know, like noun, verb, adjective, so on and so forth. Okay. So I start from observation one, word one. And remember, in MEM, I was modeling PY1, PY2, all the sentence. Remember this? Remember this, like I was modeling the pair of this, right? The transition probability of going through, let's say, tag verb starting from noun given all the sentence, right? So every time is a probability, is normalized. So let's say that I have somehow during my optimization, I went to this specific state. So I'm showing you as a, as a path. Remember that I, I said that you can view this as a path. So it seems that the, the word, the first word, preferred most of the time from going from state one to state two of the, the second one, right? Because this is 0 0.6, this is 0 0.4, right? So it's more like, it, if I ask about uh, the, the first word, it prefers to go to from a state one to always go to state two. And the, the rest of them are, are zero. And then from a state two, this is the max. Uh, this is the maximum. So it stay, stays in the state two and state two, right? This is the path. If I start from state one, most of the time goes from state one to state two. There is the, the other probabilities are zero because this sums to one, and the state is state two. But this is not the optimal path. So let's let's see why is not an optimal path. So let's start another path. If I compute the path of going from state one. And going all the way with the state one is going to be multiplication of this, this, and this. So the, multi the, the probability is going to be 0 0.9. Another path. So going from state two, the probability of staying at the state two is 0 0.18. Going from a state one to a state um, um, two, and then going from one and two, is so on and so forth. So 
if you compute this, the probability of staying at the state one is more than probability of what state one prefers. So every time the state one prefers to go, uh, most of the time, prefer to go state two, but if you go, compute these probabilities, 0 0.6, 0 0.3, 0 0.3, it's less than this. So if your objective is to find the optimal tagging, which basically boils down to find the best tag, this is not a good model because it has a bias with respect to state, because it only makes a decision locally. It doesn't account uh, the, the, the sum of the others. So, and this is what is called label bias in MEM model. So, although the most likely path or the most likely tagging would be state one, state one, state one, state one, because the decisions are local and does not account to, does not account the other uh, state, you will end up with a, with a distribution that is less likely. If you multiply them with each other, it's going to be 0 0.9 multiplied by 0 0.6, which is, is less than this, less than this one, less than this one. So the local decision is not up. Yes? Uh, this is true for HMM as well. Yes. And the reason it is true because each of these factors are locally normalized. That's, that's exactly true. So how can I do this? How can I, so because each of these decisions are locally normalized, and if I ask the state one, where do you want to go to? You say, state two all the times, right? So I have to somehow break this and say that, no, you have to look into other models as well. So one way to do that is say that, don't be normalized. At the end, if I want to find the best path, I want to remove this normalization and make all of these states dependent on each other so that my path will be optimal path. So the remedy to that is actually very simple. Instead of using local probability, use local potential, which is not normalized. So I remove the arrows, basically, between the states. So I go from this model to this model. See the difference? So I remove the arrows from y1 to y2. The problem that it introduces is that, remember, in MEM, each of the factors were normalized. But here, the normalization goes outside. So I pay the cost of computing non-local normalizer, which is harder, because I want to get the best path. So the resulting model is called linear chain theory, which, which is basically partly UGM, partly Bayesian network. So it has some directed arrows and some undirected arrows. So I remove the directionality from here because I want to I want to have this path to be dependent on each other. I don't want them to make a lo local decision. But I'm fine with going uh, through regression from x to each of the choice. And this is basically local chain. So similar to MEM, CRF is also a discriminative model. It does not model x. It's just a better model for uh, uh, joint distribution. And the only diff the other difference that I told you is that the factors are not normalized, as I told you. The Oops. So the factors are not normalized. So the this normalization goes outside. Yes. I don't remember we discussed of graphs that have direct relations and undirected. No, we didn't discuss, but that's the same. You know that all of the material. So I can do whatever I want to. I don't have to have. I don't need to use only direct or direct method. The UGM is very general, right? So what I need to, all I need to do is that if I have a graph that partially normalized and partial, partially arrowed, partially not. So what is the, the, the general graph? So still I can compute the joint distribution as multiplication of the factors. But because I have some arrow, I have some, 
connectivities or uh, factors that are not normalized, I, at the end I have to normalize. But the, the general idea applies. So if I have a net, if I have something like this, so it's going to be x1, x2, x3. The joint distribution of x1, x2, x3 is going to be p x1, p x2, p x3. If I have, let's say, that I have another network that goes like this I can write it as what somebody help px2 given x1 yes this is not arrow 2 so p so there is some factor between x2 and x3 and there is another factor that between x1 and x3, right? And a normalizer, exactly. No, but you need to have a normalizer that depends on everybody. As soon as you make one of them unnormalized, yeah. But if you think of it as, as a factor, this is still a factor. You can, I can. I call this y, side one, side two. I can call it side three. So the, the notion of factors was that it's just not normalized. But if you want to put something normal, it's okay. Make sense? All right. So, um, so what is the, the distribution of this joint distribution? Remember, so here I'm showing this as a conditional random field. So I'm, I'm modeling PY given X. I'm not modeling x. So if I write this as a factor graph, it's going to be some normalizer, bunch of terms that that has a pairwise, and a term that has goes from uh, x to y. So what is so? I just write this as an exponential, but I could have write it as a non-exponential. But it's always true. So it's like I can write it as a pair of y one y i y i minus 1 x and call the factors on ok so this is basically x of that is this this term ok now if I merge them all together I'm going to have a form like this that I'm going to have a linear term that goes from x to y and another term that goes from x to the pairs so now my question is that, is it still exponential family? What do you think? Can I write it as an exponential family? Why? But what do you mean sum of the exponential family? You're over y. If I have a random variable x and random variable y, which are exponential family, if I sum them up, it is not necessarily exponential family. But that's not the sum of the exponential family. You're oh. summing over y now. Right, but I'm not modeling. I'm just modeling y. X is covariant. It's some feature, external information. I can write. Remember the, how the exponential family look like. Exponential family look like some parameters. Sufficient statistic, normalized, log partition, and some hx. Okay, so I can do that. I can say lambda mu transpose f g. Right? I haven't left the exponential family yet. So the first term is called unary term because because it is. It has only term of y one, and the second term is called binary term because it has a pairs of y's. And you see that again and again in the context of CRF, both for imaging and for other type of things. And the other difference here is that, so in exponential family we had a z that depends on theta, right? 
Here, our z depends on x because it's like external information. But remember, we are modeling p y given x. This is a probability distribution with respect to y. And x is just some external information. It's in between Yeah, it's like, as, as, except that it's, it's not a parameter because you're not playing with this, but it's just external information. If you change the external information, your normalization also changes. Make sense? Okay. What if I want to do fancier things? So I want to say instead of pairwise, so I, told, I call this term binary, right? Because it has y1 and y2, which are next to each other. What if I want to have dependencies between y1 and y minus 2? What should I do? How does this form change? It? Do this to model the more than a pairwise dependency? Like you take away the no, arrows. but if you look at the terms, if you look at the terms, if you look at the terms, all of my terms look like something that has only okay, sorry, some things that has only y one y i with x, and something that has has y i and y i minus one x, right? What if I want to have another set of dependencies? I want to have what, I have I want to have something that y i y i minus two, which is equivalent of connecting an, with another arrow. All I need to do is just like add in extra features, right? So I had lambda transpose f y i y i minus one x. I can have I don't know new transpose. Let's call this h. Y i y i minus one y i minus two x and so on and so forth. It's just introducing dependencies is as simple as that. Computing that would be a whole different story. It might be difficult, but if you want to introduce more dependencies, it's just simple. Just come up with the features of tri triplets and, and you can do it. So um, so to to show you how uh, this uh, computation will look like. So remember the, the, the likelihood of MRF. So the likelihood of, so the data that we have for MRF is just I have a Bayesian uh, sorry an undergraduate graphical model. And uh, I back then I assumed that everything was observed. So it's basically the, the observation that I have for each of these x, uh, one through x um, so so here I'm using super index as, as, a, as, a, as a new sample. So this x is basically x1 through x4. So this was my MRF. So probability distribution of that was, was basically um, x condition on theta was exponential family, right? So I can write this as a normalizer and sum of the factors. Sorry, multiplication of the factors. Right, do you remember this form? Right? Now, if you have a CRF, now for a CRF, I have something like this. Some forms like this that there are a set of them that are observed. Call these x's, let's say, x1, x2, x3, and set of them that are unobserved and you want to estimate. So the data set that I have comes as a pairs, pair of x, y's. So the probability density of that would be I, I'm interested in com uh, computing p given x. So my z depends on the parameters and also x. And my factors are basically these joint factors of y's and x's. So if you com compare these two, see that my factors as x, y, here y has only x's. And the normalizer only depends on the parameters, while normals and CRF depends on parameter and observed covariance. 
So the, how does the, 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 the likelihood of this look like? I mean, of course, the likelihood of that, if I, um, so the likelihood of MRF would be log of, um, so the log with respect to theta and data is going to be log of px comma theta is going to be sum over samples sum over factors log of p um, sorry, factor c x c and theta minus log partition function right this was the mrf that you have seen before last week for the crf would be one over n samples factors pairs of factors and observation and a log of theta annexes. This is just log of this substituting data in. All right. So now, what is the derivative? So do you remember the form of derivative of the log likelihood? Do you remember the form of the derivative of the log likelihood with respect to theta for MRF? It shows up as two expectations, right? Some empirical minus the actual. Do you remember how it looks like? Anybody? No? No. So if I take a derivative with respect to this, would be if I let's say that if, if each of these theta c's are independent, if I take a derivative with respect to c. Only this term shows up, so I'm going to have only this term and the log partition number was expectation, right? It was expectation with respect to um, so here I'm writing things for CRF for you. So C log partition of um, so let me write this as a as a as a as a feature. So I'm gonna write this as I'm gonna use the featureization now. So X C Y C and I'm going to use this as um, some theta C transpose this, right? Okay. So the log of that would be this. It's going to be features of XC minus YC. So to compute, this is, and again, so let me write it as a, as a form of features. If I, if I write it as a form of features, it's going to be YN, F, XC, YC. So this was empirical mean minus the actual mean that you have already seen before. And to compute this mean, you have to compute these marginals. So you need an inference. This is basically from last week. Learning the parameters of fully observe UGM. So that the game is the same, except that the features look different and has X in it. Everything's the same. Do people remember any of that? Or not yet? Maybe you will remember when you start doing homework. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so to compare these three uh, uh, methods, HMM, just do the, uh, the, the counting, uh, it's, not, it's very simple to do the learning on that because everything was normalized. 
and uh, the, all you needed to do was uh, basically to compute the state of y, you have to go and count it, and it was the form of the, the theta was maximum likelihood estimation. In MEM, MEMM, you have to use the gradients, but it has the gradient, it has the bias of the labels. Linear chain CRF doesn't have the problem, but uh, because it's removing the normalization makes everything dependent, but it has some issues. Uh, it, it, it's difficult to learn because every time that you want to make a gradient, you have to do inference. And that's a problem. Well, it's difficult, not a problem. So how so we, we keep showing you this F. X, Y, is like it seems a feature. It's a feature, but I haven't told you how to come up with the features. Like, what is this function? So in the following, I'm going to give you some ideas how to build these features. So if you, were, if you wanted to part of speech tagging, so one of these would be, so if these features were a function of X, which is the word that you see, and a tag. So it would be um, very obvious to to say that how many times I've seen the words, I go over my corpus, my dictionary, or whatever uh, that I'm using, how many times I've seen the word like showing up as a, as a program? One, that, that could be one feature. Another, so you can view this count as a log emission program in HMM, although like here nothing is normalized, but here you, you, you can design it that way. Another idea would be, well, how many times the tag P even possible? Maybe, in English, we don't use this. Uh, I mean, of course, we always have verb, I guess. Uh, so a sentence without verb doesn't make sense, but we don't use all of, all of the, the possible tags. So some of the tags are less likely. So you can think of it as a, as a, as a prior probability uh, of, uh, of, of, of a word. Another idea would be count of the how many times we see P in the middle of the sentence. Is it possible to start the sentence with uh, we, 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 let's say that how many times is possible to start a, ver start a sentence with a noun? How many, how many, uh, how many times is possible to start a sentence with adjective? I guess it's not very likely, but I haven't seen any, any sentence starting with an adjective. It's always done. Right? No. So, beautiful people then. So then it's less. Uh, it's, it's not exactly zero. So, uh, so you can use this. As your uh, pro, as some sort of like a, how likely it is that you design a, a feature, and you can also use the pairs of the uh, of the verb. So remember my feature, the other feature that I had was look like y i y i minus y and x. So if this is y i minus one, this is y i. So how many times you see verb, and so you can use these uh, recipes to 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 design features. So, and of course, this is the laundry list of, uh, of, the, way, of the way that you, you can do this. And then you can combine all of this with some sort of like a template. So you can say that, um, okay, so I'm just like having more uh, laundry list. Um, and as I told you, if you want to have more dependencies, if you want to have a features that is dependent on yi, yi minus one, one i minus two, you can come up with, with triplets instead of uh, uh, doubles. And at the end, you can combine these features with some sort of like a template. And this basically, this basically gives you a way that you can build easily thousands of features for each of these uh, parameters. So your F can be 1,000 dimensional. So how, how you can do this, you can say that uh, uh, how many times I have seen where followed by a suffix w. So, and count it over your corpus, and that here goes, it will, will be your uh, new uh, features that you have. So you have to go and engineer all of these features. So I'm gonna pause here and, and give you that, well, here to design is sufficient statistic, we have to put a lot of effort designing good features. So here, hopefully give you some appreciation for methods that are based on deep learning that hopefully can be used as a feature in this case. You can use your deep learning method to give you a feature and learn things jointly. But of course, one way of to do that is to hand engineer the features. Um, okay, so I'm gonna skip that because I haven't talked about the imaging yet. Uh, so to compare the generative model and uh, this model, so I'm gonna give you 
uh, a, a, a graph. So uh, this is some studies uh, done by Liang and Jordan back in 2008. They applied part of speech tagging on two data sets. One was a real data set from Penn Three Banks, and the other one was artificially created data set using HMM. If you compare the accuracy of these two, for the, uh, for the data set that are synthesized, of course HMM does better. But HMM necessarily is not a good idea for a real data set. So this hopefully the take home message of that is that if the model is misspecified, most of the time discriminative models are better. And in reality, models are misspecified. You don't have very explicit model of the of the world. So if your objective is to do a specific task such as tagging, go for conditional model. Because your unless your generative fully generative models are not exact uh, the true uh, represent, uh, representation of the world is not going to work better. But if the model if the, the model is close to the truth, you see that HMM does better. To compare HMM and MEM and CR, CMRF, uh, these are two different uh, error and auto vocabulary error, just view it as two different measures, of, two different um, uh, evaluation measures. So you can't really make a decision between uh, HMM, MEM, and CRF on a real data set, but if you incorporate additional uh, spell checking, usually CRF performs better than HMM and uh, and uh, CRF performs better than MEM, which are here unrepresented as CRF plus that incorporates spelling. And they're both way better than uh, HMM. So this is basically another take home message that for real data, if you design good features, go with conditional law. Also in all of these, I told you uh, things about um, using maximum likelihood estimation. But sometimes there are discrepancies between what you are evaluated with and what you are training. So if you so using maximum likelihood estimation is not necessarily the best thing. Um, uh, because it depends if your goal is to, I don't know, beat the, the benchmark and the benchmark is using specific loss function, why not using that loss function? So a way to do that is you basically using uh, um, minimum base risk estimator, the idea is as this. Uh, the idea is very simple. You want to fit a model of P, Y given X, but not all of your Y's, not all of the configurations are equally uh, scored. For example, if I have a sentence and it might be more, uh, it might, I may have to pay more penalty to tag the word, let's say, like as an adjective, uh, than tagging it incorrectly as, an, as, as a verb, because that's my measurement criteria. So let's say that that's a benchmark that you, are, um, you want to beat. So that benchmark gives you a risk, and you have to incorporate that risk. So how can we do that? So the idea is this. We, instead of, um, instead of computing the log of P, Y given X, we compute the expectation of your loss that's coming from your domain. So I'll give you some examples of that. So this is basically what you have observed in your data set, and this is what you estimate. So and so you basically train a model. You say that like let's say that my for uh, for my current iteration theta equal to t. So I compute this expectation that it's coming from my, so somebody has given me, this is the criteria that you have to optimize if you want to beat that benchmark. So I have to optimize my Y so that my risk is minimized. That's called a decoder, or um, I think people call it, uh, yeah, it's the loss decoder. So what are the examples of this? So let's say that if your criteria is Hamming distance, you have to get every single tag right, unless the, the, there is no, uh, uh, there is no, uh, the, 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 you will be penalized, then the, the, the equivalent loss function would be my prediction and the ground truth should be exactly the same. Otherwise, the loss, I'm, I'm not going to give you anything uh, positive. Then, ex comp computing that expectation to compute that uh, the decoder would be equivalent of 
finding the best y. So your decoder would be find the y. So if I compute this, uh, my decoder would be minimizing this, which would be what, what? Like maximizing this. So the, every step of the decoder, I'm doing a map estimator. Does that make sense? Because if I'm minimizing this, I'm basically maximizing this guy, right? I'm searching over all y's that gives me the maximum value of this. So if your last function is, if, if the last function you're evaluating with is, is a Hamming distance, is equivalent of doing map estimation in every iteration. Here's another one. So you may say that, yeah, so overall, should, should be, uh, you don't have to get all of the, all of the, uh, the verbs, like, but marginally you have to be correct. So my last function, that, uh, the last function that you're, you'll be evaluated with would be uh, uh, not getting everything right, but getting most of the things right, right? So if I have a sentence and I have a tagging of V, P, uh, I don't know, N, I'll get, and the, the truth is V, P, I don't know, uh, something in uh, P. So I get correct, correct, incorrect. Right? So this is another loss. This is a hand loss. Um, so this would be sum over the marginal. So the equivalent of that would be for each of the, the, the tags, you have to compute the marginals and sum them up. So what is the difference between them is that when you, want to, when you have explicit loss function, use that loss function and then take it. And most of the time that boils down, you have to do inference anyway because all of those boils down to a specific kind of inference, but that would be uh, the case. I don't think I have time to go over the, the segmentation uh, and the imaging application, but I guess uh, you guys can over it yourself. Thank you.